We're going to start our new series today. I'm calling it Living in Babylon. So if you want to take your Bibles and open to Daniel chapter 1, most of the series we're going to look in the book of Daniel. Uh, we're, we're not going to spend but just a moment in the book of Daniel today, and then we're going to go to Isaiah chapter number 5. We're, we're living in um, exactly the time the Lord has called us to be in. Uh, I am so grateful that my Lord and my Savior allowed me to be born in this country that we live in. To the parents that I have who are now in heaven. Um, my, my mama's birthday was this week and uh, I got to think a lot about that. got to think a lot about heaven and uh, the glory of everybody being there and everybody being happy and Everybody getting along, everybody loves everybody, everybody's just totally content, everybody's just happy in Jesus and just being in the glory of God and, and not having to chase shadows and not having to go through all of those things. No more heartache, no more pain, no more of those ugly memories, the chatter that comes in your ear, just putting the past in the past and looking forth eternal more into that which gets better and better and better and better and better. Amen? Your toast is not burnt. Your oatmeal is not lumpy. Everything's going to be glorious in heaven. Amen? And I thought a lot about that. And I said, yes, but God has us here now. And a lot of people want to complain about everything that goes on in the world. And I understand and you understand. We know that everything that goes on in the world does not please our Father. There are a lot of things that we look at and we just shake our heads and we just say, it should not be. But yet, we often forget that sinners act like sinners. And that's why we're here. We have had the great privilege of the glorious light of Jesus Christ shining upon us. I'll never forget the day. Never, ever, ever will I forget the day that the Lord called me. And I stepped away from all those things that were the guilt and the shame of sin. I felt like I was going to explode, but I found the Lord faithful. And He took me from all of that dreariness and burden to happiness and joy. And, you know, I'm still in this world. And yes, there's been some hard times. There's been some difficult things. We've all faced them. But yet, the glory of God shines through in the darkness. And that's what the church is to be. Now, we're going to look in this series, we're going to look at what the world looks like and how the world wants to change us to look like them. But we're sent on mission to help them look like our Lord. This earth is a trial place. And we, as Christians, we get to put on the heaven suit. Every day we get to wake up and put on a redeemed heaven suit and walk out in the world to get them, give them a glimpse of what God could do. It is this day, it is this hour that God sends us to be missionaries in this world. People need the Lord. I sat at a ball game yesterday. Yes, we were at the Holy Lands between the hedges. And Georgia won, amen, hallelujah, praise God. All you Tech fans, y'all won too. The rapture may come. That's two in a row. Woo! Oh my goodness. Well, miracles do happen in this world, amen. But I was sitting there and, and, and after we had been winning for a while, the, the crowd began to thin out. And we stayed until we were ready to take a knee at the end. But, but my, uh, my best friends, Jeff and his wife and Lynn and I were at the ball game. And, and it was somewhere in the, in the beginning of the fourth quarter. And, and the people beside us, there was a couple that got mad and got fussing and got into a fight. And he just got up and walked over about 10 feet. And the crowd was thin enough to where he could. And he just sat down. And they just looked at back and forth at each other and they were they were speaking in tongues is what they were doing. I don't think it was a spirit-led speaking in tongues though. And I just thought to myself how grateful I am to have somebody that loves me 
and how wonderful it is to know that there's nothing between me and my God and nothing between me and my wife. And I want to put her first. And for some strange reason, she wants me to be put first. And I looked at them and I said, you know, they're just victims of the things and the ways that this world looks at. And he felt justified and she felt justified. And can we just talk for a second? I don't want to live that way. And yet the world wants to live that way. When I came in, I was talking to Kale. Can I speak of what we talked about? And I said, how's my greatest crime scene investigator? And he said he had a tough week. And I read about it in the paper, but it was his crime scene where a 18-year-old boy was shot by a couple 17-year-old boys, ambushed because they liked his clothes. And a couple weeks ago, asked him and said, we want to buy your clothes. And he wouldn't say, I'm not going to sell you my clothes. So they found him and ambushed him and killed him. How we have devalued life. And this is the world that we came to minister in. And we have questions about why God allows so much to happen. And yet God has a plan. Would y'all agree? If you don't agree, you're going to be a dreadful Christian and you're going you're gonna to walk around miserable and complaining and griping, and you're not going to make anybody's life better. You better understand, God has a plan. God is in control. He's still on the throne. And He has a plan for good. And He has invited us to be a part of it. Amen? I'm not going to make you stand up in honor of reading God's Word because we're going to look at so much Scripture. But in Daniel chapter 1, Verse 1, the Bible says this, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, y'all ever heard of him? Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Let's pray. Now, Father, I pray in the next few moments that... Um, you would call us into Yourself. Let us see Your will, Your way, Your Spirit, Jesus, Your work, Your redemption, and our place in it. Father, we don't have to be convinced that this is an evil world, and we don't have to be convinced that there is sin, and we don't have to be convinced that we have not done everything that we could, and we have strayed and wandered from the way that would bring You honor and glory and praise. But, Lord, here we are. Help us to see Jesus. Help us to see Your will. And Lord, let us be encouraged to be a part of Your plan. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I was amazed by this fact. And I really just stopped right here and I said, we need to talk about this. Because it says plainly, the Lord gave Jehoiakim. Now, Jehoiakim is simply the king, and he's a representative for the people of Israel at that point in time. It wasn't just Jehoiakim who was taken into captivity. All of Israel was taken into captivity. And it wasn't simply because of Jeho Jehoiakim's sin. It was the sin of all the people. God had a plan for Israel. God called them. Matter of fact, their father Abraham was in the Ur of the Chaldees in Babylon, and he said, come out from that place to the place that he would call the promised land. And from that place, God began a, to build a people directly for Himself. Not because He didn't love all people, for God so loves the world. Amen? But He called a group of people out so that they could be a light, so that they could be a witness, so that people could see the goodness of God and how God was so willing to bless His people. I hope you know this. I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher, but I'm here to tell you that the truth of it is God wants to bless God wants to bless those that are seeking after His heart. God wants to pour out His goodness on you. That's why He's invited us to heaven. To give us His best. And we have His Spirit within us. And no matter the place that we're at, no matter the condition, no matter the, the times, no matter of how hard it may be, we can still live in God's best. But it's not just about us. It's not just about us. 
People today, the smart ones that I get to read about, I'm not, I don't know all those things, but I get to learn from them, they call this now a consumer Christianity. What they mean by that is that Christians today are consumers. Instead of being people who give their heart and life to Christ and come to seek how they can serve in this world for the glory of God, for the benefit of everyone else, it's become about the Christian. So everything in God's people, everything in God's church is built around making sure that everybody else gets what they want. And if you don't give them what they want, they'll go somewhere else to find it. And churches, instead of engaging in and grabbing hold of the mission, they feel like that their job is to, to grow and to, and to have all these things. So, so what they need to do is to make sure that they're giving the consumer what that they need. Instead of giving God that which honors Him. Somewhere along the line, the, the, the script is flipped. Instead of serve the Lord with gladness, it's let the church serve us so that we can be glad. In the New Holland, I love you. And, and, and I, I'm here to tell you, I think that you have a great spirit of wanting to do the right thing. And I want you to hear me really well in the next few moments. I am as encouraged as I ever have been about what God is doing in this bleak, dark world. We've come through some times, haven't we? I've been your pastor for three and a half years. I think some would say two years of that was stolen by COVID. We were rocking and going in a certain direction, and all of a sudden we hit the pause button. And now the world, I believe we're in a post-COVID world. I know that there are people out there saying, you, some of them are saying, we're going to have to get injected for the rest of our life. Well, praise God. Amen. Whatever. I don't know. I'm going to get in, I got injected with Jesus and I'm going to get to heaven one day and I might make it sick, but most likely I'm not going to be feeling good when I die. <laughs> but right now, I have gotten my eyes off of the world in a way of, of just griping and complaining about it. And I'm, I'm starting to look at the world like I looked at the couple yesterday that were fussing and fighting. And, and I'm starting to say, this is, the, this is the place that God wants us to be, doing what God wants us to do. And we've got to be different. 1 John chapter 2, 15 says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world... The love of the Father is not in him. That's not my words. The love of the Father is not in him. Oh my. 1 John 3, 1 says, Beloved, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. How wonderful it is, how blessed it is to be a child of God. Today, in these circumstances, we are children of the Holy One. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Don't be surprised that we are rubbing the world in the wrong way. They don't like it. James 2 verse 5 says this, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? And to that I say amen, which He promised to those who love Him. Also, John chapter 15 says this, mm. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, the world hates you. Don't be surprised by that. And by the way, quit trying to make the world love you. We want to look like it. We want to be impressed by it. We want to have it. We want to, be, we want to be exactly like the world. I don't think that's going to please God. And God gave Israel over to a foreign country, Babylon, because they were living like the world rather than honoring God. 
Isaiah chapter number five. If you have your Bibles, flip over there. By the way, I put on my watch today. I got to church and looked, and I got a dead battery. Lance said, oh, Lord, you preach for three hours. But I'm reminded there is a clock up there, and I do see it. I want to talk to you about uh, Isaiah was in this time when the children of Israel had an opportunity to change, and they didn't change. And they had an opportunity to serve the Lord. And God gave a word to Isaiah to remind the people what God had done so very much for them, and yet because they would not listen, there were ramifications. You know, we do reap what we sow. So in Isaiah 5, it says this, verse 1, Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. He gives us a picture here of a vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up, cleared out the stones, planted in it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst, also made a wine press in it. So he expected to bring forth good grapes. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? He said, I'll tell you what, let's clear this thing out. It's on a very choice hill. It's an absolute wonderful place. My, my goodness, let's do it. Let's, let's plant the, the greatest things. Let's, every, all the obstacles, let's get the stones. Let's get everything else out of the way. Let's put a tower in it there for its protection. Let's put the wine press there so that we can get down to business. We expected it to bring forth good grapes, but at the end of verse 2, it says it brought forth wild grapes. Berries, wild grapes. Bu'ushin is the word. It literally means sour grapes. Have you ever picked up a grape and you look at it, oh, that looks so good, and you threw it in there and it went, ooh, my, ooh. Now, God has done so much for America. We don't have the time to talk about how the Lord called our country from a place looking so that we could have religious freedom. And we came here and God gave us founding fathers. Some were believers, some were not. But even those that were not believers, the providential hand of God was on them to help us establish ourselves as a great country and a great freedom. And we fought for it and we did the right things. But yet how quickly we were to turn away. But yet, God gave us the first great awakening and called us back to Himself. But how, and, and that was before the revolution so that we could be prepared, and yet we turned away. And before that battle that we had in America, the Civil War, there was the second great awakening. And God wanted to, to do so much among His people at a, at a very particular time, and yet we turned away. After World War I, when the people were pulling back to God and prohibition and, and we said we want to we want to live our life for the lord and yet we so quickly turned away after world war ii and, and the 50s and 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 people have morals and all that it was followed by the 60s Rev, revolution in the people the the sex generation drugs alcohol and all of those things and, and we've been for 60 years been chasing after what solomon called vanity how quickly we've moved away from all of the times, but yet we can see that in this place, God has done so much for us and he wanted a people unto himself to be a witness to the world. But we've brought forth bushin, sour berries. Verse three, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. He says, let's look at it. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I did not do, that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes, sour berries? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. Listen, America. I will take away its hedge. It shall be burned down. I will break down its walls. It shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug. And there shall come up briars and thorns. You don't have to plant those. They just come. Neglect is all you have to do. 
You take away those that are working it. And it will just be, it will be in shambles in no time whatsoever. The thorns will be there. I also will command the clouds and they will rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. It looked for justice, but, the, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but hold a cry for help. Now there's a series of woes. And I think we just need to hear the condition of the world, and we need to see the, the world as God sees it. And we need to even have an x-ray of our own heart and be encouraged. I, I think this is exactly where we are today. And I, this is exactly where God has called us, New Holland, to be people of love and people of prayer and people who care and people who will share and, and to serve the Lord in this place that God's put us. Verse number 8. Woe to those who join houses to houses. They add field to field till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. Materialism, folks. Building, 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 building. Do that sound familiar? We want more, we want more. You remember the parable in the New Testament? They had the, the, the places to, to, the, 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 to put the grain, but they tore those down to be greater ones, to have even more grain. It seems like nothing is ever enough today. In the hearing, the Lord of hosts says, Truly, many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones without inhabitation. All these things that we think that we have to have will become desolate. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath. A homer of seed shall yield one effort. That's worthlessness. You put all this work into something. You want to build this, your, your castle on earth. You want to build all that. But he says nothing will come from it. You'll yield nothing. All your labor, all your money will be vain. Verse 11, woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink. I saw them at the Georgia game yesterday. Who continue until night till white wine inflames them. The harp and the strings, the tambourine, the flute, the wine are in their feasts, but they do not regard the work of the Lord nor consider the operation of His hands. All of these things that we in this world call fun. And we're chasing after fun. And we work so that we can have fun. And we spend our money after what the world says, if you follow this, you'll have fun. It's not much fun, is it? Oh, sin thrills. Oh, absolutely, before it kills. I had a friend call me this week. It's never just one sin. It's one that leads to the next, that leads to the next, that leads to the next. She said her son has now become an alcoholic. His father died two years ago, and he began to drink more and more and more. And his best friend committed suicide three weeks ago. He's in his mid-20s. And she called, and she said, Brian, can you help us find him a place? We need to get him in a rehab. And I said, I'll do everything I can. I say that to say you, all those young people, they never want to say, I want my life to be ruined. They're chasing after fun, but they don't know that if you follow the ways of this world, it will leave you bankrupt. Verse 13, therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. The captivity came because they were chasing after things that, that were not wise. They have no knowledge. Does that sound like the world today? Everybody who thinks that they know everything. My best friend was talking to me yesterday. He says, he said, Brian, I'm just not woke. And I said, amen, hallelujah. And these people today say that they have the ways that, the, the, the ways that a country should go and the ways that everybody should go, and just, there's no knowledge there. Their honorable men are famished. Their multitudes dried up with thirst. Therefore, hell, Sheol, the grave, has enlarged itself. Hell is growing. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way, but people don't want to follow the narrow path. They want to go in the broad way. And hell is growing. It opened its mouth beyond measure, their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he who is jubilant shall descend into the grave, into hell. 
They don't ever, they don't realize it when they're chasing these things that, that there's an eternal damnation that comes because of it. That one that my friend's friend, friends, uh, friend got into it and committed suicide. They don't know that they're going to, they think that they're going to get, get away from the troubles, but they're not. Only the Lord is the way to get away from troubles. Verse 15, people should be brought down. Each man shall be humbled. Bold, that needs to happen. The eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and he who is holy shall be hallowed, holy in righteousness. God is righteous. If people would humble themselves, they could see that. There, then the lambs shall feed in their pasture. In the waste places of the fat ones, strangers shall eat. Verse 18, woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if it were a, a cart rope. I call this a parade of the flesh. They're, they're, they're drawing iniquity with cords of vanity. It's like they're, they're wanting everyone to see their sin. They're, they're, there is no shame. They're just putting it out there in front of everyone. What would make people blush? They're not blushing anymore. What would make people hide in their sin? They're just openly putting it out there and saying, this is our life. We love it. No shame whatsoever. Verse 19, that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. And the counsels of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. They're scoffers. Not only are they just putting their sin out on like a parade. They scoff at everything that's right. In the great universities that we have in our country today, there are conservative Christian people that are there, have been asked to come speak, and they're being booed off the stage before they can even say anything. Scoffers that don't want to hear truth. Matter of fact, we're living in a day where if, 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 you, if they disagree with you, they want you to be quiet, but they don't want to be quiet. They're going to parade themselves out there and just yell you down. That's where God has called us to minister. Remember, He speaks with a whisper. He doesn't have to speak with a shout. And He wants us to live these lives of just being with people every day, living the Christian life in front of them, letting it be an example, letting our words speak of the value of Jesus, the truth of Christ, the redemption and the, and the graciousness of God that He's done for us, being a child of the King, and what God can do for them as well. God can shout it to them. God will shout it to them. Look what it says in verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Does that not sound like the world today? Just watch the news. Verse 21. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, prudent in their own sight. Woe to them. Warning to them. You know, a lot of people today want to speak, but nobody wants to listen. A lot of people want to say, if you'll just listen to me, but they won't listen to the Word of God. Verse 22, woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink. I, I just want to tell you, it's not just the wine, it's oxycodone, Percocet, all the opiates that are out there. Most of the time, when people get addicted to those today, it's because it began with a prescription from a legal doctor because of a real need. And yet, People get addicted to these things and it leads them down a path. It's an extremely, we, we are, there's so much fentanyl in this world today and it's crossing over our borders. Fentanyl, I don't know that you know this, but if you had a pen up here, enough fentanyl on the top that would fit on the top of a pen, the top of a needle will kill a person. They have to get chemists to break this stuff down. And this is the world in which we're living. 
This is the world that our teenagers are out there eating in it, and, and they don't have anybody that's loving them to truth. Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 23, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice for the righteous man. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble, doesn't fire take care of the stubble? And the flame consumes the chaff. So their root will be as rottenness and their, their bosom will ascend like dust because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One. This is what I'm excited about. In this world that we live in, that is so dark, so dreary, they're living in the quicksand and they don't know it. I'm so excited because the darker it gets, the more heartbroken people are, the more they're open to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not sure if there's ever been a day where people are not hurting so badly that they're not open to hear the truth. We must get ready we must, as it says in Joshua chapter 3, before they were to walk into the promised land, we must sanctify ourselves. Very quickly in Isaiah chapter 6, in this situation, Isaiah was there. Isaiah was traumatized. His, his, his mentor, Uzziah, had died. And in that moment, God looked down at Isaiah and God called Isaiah to himself to give Isaiah a glimpse of himself. And when Isaiah saw that, he fell down and saw his sin. And yet, that was just the beginning point. And that's what it should be with us. When we come to the house of God, when we look at the Word of God, when, when we see God in His glory and we pray to Him, yes, our sin, the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And we should be convicted in that. And it doesn't not just to leave us there. That's a launching point to glory in our life. If we see it and we embrace it and we see the love of Christ and what He wants to do in our life, then we're open to a great mighty movement of God. And it says in Isaiah 6 here, when it's talking about it, he saw his sin, but, but God sent one of the seraphim down to him in verse 6 to take one of the live coals from the tongs of the altar, and he touched his mouth, and, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. That's what Christ did for us. He took our iniquity away. He purged us. And now when He looks at us, He sees us through the Holy Spirit. He sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And He sees us pure. What was Isaiah's reaction? Verse number 8. He, or no, Excuse me, what was the call? He said, I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? In this dark world, Isaiah now understands redemption. And the call is there. In this dark world, who will go? Listen to Isaiah. Here I am. Send me. That's what God's calling for us as Christians today. By the way, when I'm speaking to you today, I'm not talking about just New Holland. I'm talking about every church that we need to get shoulder to shoulder with in this community. Everywhere that where the Word of God is being, being proclaimed in all the world, we need to lift them up in prayer because we're all in this together. We're the body of Christ, the kingdom of God. We all need to say, here am I. Where I'm at. Where God allowed me to be born. Where the Spirit found me. Where Jesus redeemed me, send me. So, <laughs> verse 9, he said, go and tell this people. Verse 11, then he said, Lord, how long? <laughs> how long am I going to keep doing this? I'm not going to get into all this, but the you know, Lord's saying, cheer up, it's not going to be easy. If you're waiting for the perfect person to come across and beg you to come to you and say, would you please tell me about Jesus? You might have to go and invest in them and share with them lovingly, kindly, the goodness of God. How long are we going to have to do this? Verse, 10, verse 13 says, 
and yet a tenth will be in it. Church, look up here. We're not going to win the world. I wish. Not everybody's going to repent. Not everybody's going to listen. But some will. If you're waiting till we get a plan where we can win the world, we're going to be waiting a while. But a tent, a tithe, or waiting. You don't know which ones they are. You're going to have to find them. Hear this and hear this well. If we do our part, God's already promised he'll do his part. I don't know how many lost there are in our county, but they got us outnumbered. I wonder how many the Holy Spirit's been whispering to their heart. They're ready. They're ready. We're living in Babylon, folks. We're living in Babylon. This is where God sent us. This is where he wants us to be. Who will go for us? Are you willing to say, here am I? Send me. Send me.